Hello, everybody. Let's try this again. I am in the vortex of technology hell <laughs> this week. I don't know what is going on with technology, but uh, it is really my nemesis this week. Hey, guys. Welcome. Thank you for patience with me. I've had one video where the video was glitchy. I had another video where the sound was poo. And then today, this mic, I got this new mic. And it's amazing when it's amazing, but for some reason, it just doesn't work some of the times. I don't know what the heck is going on, but it's taunting me. I'm going to have to like, oh, I hate sending it back, but I might have to. Urgh. Welcome. I am Carrie the Mortician, and this is where you get to ask me live things all about funerals, about anything you want to ask me about with myself, being a funeral director, anything. So welcome, welcome. Um, today, this video with sound uh, is in memory of Kathleen Morton. Uh, she died one year ago today and her son is a viewer subscriber and he had shared my videos with her before she had died and they brought a lot of I think, um, peace to her. And she was able to have some difficult conversations with her family after watching some of my videos. So if you can take a moment, think about Kathleen Morton and her family today. Today's about her. So thank you all for joining. So <laughs> let's get started. Our first question is, do I feel differently um, caring for children now that I'm a mom? And it's such a good question. It definitely changes your perspective. I think if you're in love and you are with somebody, it definitely changes your perspective caring for somebody that loses a spouse. And as a parent, when you do bury somebody who is a child, I think at any age, you think about what about when I lose my child or if I lose my child. And so even when it's a kid, it doesn't matter. It's still a child situation because even if I'm 70 and my child dies at 50, that's still my child I would be bearing. So I think that definitely kind of sinks, sinks its way into your mind when you're working um, with families and taking care of people. And so sometimes those thoughts can overtake and bring you down a little bit. But like I've always said, when you're caring for someone, you have to keep reminding yourself. This is not my loss. This is not my family. This is not about me. This is about them. And I need to take care of them. And I have to focus on my role right now, which is not as a parent. It is as a funeral director caregiver. So I definitely keep reminding myself of that the whole time. But I do find myself with kids taking a few extra moments, um, maybe holding their hands, um, babies, always holding babies. If there's, you know, that opportunity around, you just want to hold a baby, whether they're dead or not, they're still a baby and you feel like ingrained in you to hold them. Um, but I think things definitely, um, hurt a little more, especially scenarios like an abuse situation or something, they just hurt a little deeper and a little more as a parent when you're observing those things. Hello, everybody. Oh, that sucked like a choker. <laughs> oh, I just take a breath. I get frustrated with this technology. And what's weird is I just did a video for my Patreon, the top tier. I do a live video each month for them special. And I just did that video and everything was fine. And I didn't touch anything. So it should have still been working. Questions, guys. You touched on reframing your mind early on in your career around feeling like you're hurting a deceased. I'm worried I'll feel like I'm invading privacy when bathing a decedent. Is that a common feeling? Not really. It goes away pretty quickly. Just like a doctor, you look at the individual not as a person, but as a body. In essence, when you're doing things to get them, you know, that, that middle part before you get them dressed and stuff. I feel like uh, it's very just functional and anatomical when you're taking care of doing the embalming and the bathing and stuff. Then when you go over to getting them dressed and stuff, it's more back to them as a person and the personality shows a little more through clothing and things. So 
thinking about things a little different as you're going through. Um, definitely. It's funny because my kids actually asked me this morning about who sees somebody when they're naked at work and, you know, the dead people. And, um, do I see na- naked people and, you know, how do I think about that? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you go to the doctor's office and they look at you naked. They're like, yeah. And I said, well, it's the same thing. So it's really weird that you guys asked that because I just had this conversation with my kids this morning. Do you have a side of the business? Ooh, sorry. That question flew through. Um, you like more working in the prep room or working with a family, both equally, depending on the day. I think as I'm getting older, some days I like working with the families, but then I also get maybe rubbed the wrong way a little bit faster, just because sometimes we work with, and it seems to come in strings and it'll be like, man, is there a full moon where you work with families that are just more demanding and more abrasive or more um, confrontational when they walk in and it seems like they come in groups and it's like, what is going on this week? (laughs) So, um, I feel like some of that, when you're in the beginning, it doesn't see as seem as piled up as maybe it does later in your career. So it just depends how long can a body be kept in a cold storage at the hospital or funeral home and what happens to the condition of the body? your body is still decomposing, even when in cold storage. And what'll happen if you freeze the body is when you unfreeze that body, that body essentially catches up to where the decomposing was or should be at that time. So the body is still decomposing, no matter if they're cold or frozen or anything. So the tissue is getting, it's like smushy. I don't even know how to describe that your tissue is breaking down and it just turns in this like smushy. I'm going to need to find a good analogy to how that feels, um, how the tissue feels, but it's, it's a weird texture after somebody has been in a cooler for a long time. I'll think of an analogy for that. I usually can come up with some good analogy for you guys. What ideas do you have any, any of the future of the funeral industry? What would you like to see added as services in the funeral home? Um, I think the funeral industry is evolving as it's going to be for the next probably 10 years at least, where we're not just order takers or planning of this traditional services. We're, we're um, option offerers. And we need to be option offerers because there's so many options available that people don't know about. We need to help families find memorial service spaces and gathering spaces. And we need to provide some of those spaces by repurposing our facilities or adding on to facilities because people want unique experiences and they need places that they can gather and things that they can do. You don't have the facilities in your towns like maybe you used to where there was an Elks Lodge and a VFW and an American Legion and um, uh, a Mason's Lodge and all these places that you could use for spaces to gather in to have luncheons and memorial services and all of these things. And so without some of those spaces, we need new spaces, economical spaces, places that are fiscally responsible for families to choose. Because if you go to maybe where someone would hold a wedding, it's a hefty fee to rent those spaces and to get catering and to do this and to do that. So the funeral home can provide through those services, through the full services options in terms of that. Um, It doesn't matter what the disposition choice is. It doesn't mean the family wants to just be done with you because they choose a direct service. They still may want a place to gather and they may want you to help with some other things. Um, So the funeral director is assuming that that's what they mean by it is, is, their own fault and detriment to their own business um, because you can still discuss all these other options. So I think it's just providing options and helping people see what's available. Um, Don't you think the state should somehow step in to help funeral homes when they're restricting them from doing 24 seven funerals? Um, Well, and I think the states are help stepping in by having to get the the cooler trailers and things at at hospitals and stuff. Um, I think that's one way that they're stepping in to help. Hey, Rosio in California. In states that require mortician funeral directors to be present for a funeral, who pays in cases of deceased having no next to kin? Does the district state administration 
arrange funeral burial. It depends. Every county and state is a little different. Some may do a direct burial. Some may do a direct cremation. Um, some may hold the body for a certain period of time. So they're all very different. Essentially, the funeral home donates their services for the most part to care for those people. Have you ever had a family member not care or feel more burdened by their arrangements than the loved one? Yes, I've had families that are, it's a very quick arrangement. It's just to meet the needs and then we're done. Um, that they're just handling them because they have to, or they feel like they have to. Um, you know, everybody doesn't love their family. Everybody doesn't get along. It just is not, it's not the case. Everybody doesn't want there to be something, but when you have a dead body, you have to dispose of it somehow um, legally. And so some people feel like they're just there because they have to be. Um, which is, you know, it's just one of the spectrum of how people feel. My cousin died at eight years old. He got sick and died. At autopsy did not find a reason as to why he died. His dad never got over the death. <sighs> there are some deaths that are unexplained. And that is what is on the death certificate. And it is crazy that can, with our medical technology, that that can be something but things can happen in the body that leave no trail. Um, one of the things, so there's, um, and I think this is how Princess Diana is what they say, where basically your heart gets whiplash. It, it goes forward and back. And it happens sometimes in car accidents or like quick movements where your heart, because it's whipped, it goes out of rhythm and you eventually just die. And I've cared for people um, one gentleman was in a car accident. He got out of the car, was just fine standing there and then dropped dead. Just boom. And that they did a very intensive autopsy, found nothing that could have caused his death. And they said at the end that possibly could be what had caused it, but there is no trace of that within the body. It's just a theory to what could cause the death because of what led up to the death. And that's a, the best guess, but they can't put it on the death certificate if there's no concrete proof. So that unexplained death leaves somebody wondering if they could have prevented it. So I can see where for that child, the family could be really left in this open-ended wondering forever, um, and which is terrible and it's sad. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes... That is just what it is. Um, Chelsea. So he's still around, you know, three years or four years later from his terminal brain cancer. Um, so, yeah. What happens to the deceased lips? What do you mean what happens to them? Have you ever had to turn a family away because of drama fighting or just too many demands? Yes, it does happen where families don't want to allow you to do your job. Um, it's not often, thankfully, but where families try to micromanage everything you're doing instead of letting you do your job. And it gets to be too time consuming because you are eventually, you go forward one step and then backwards two and then forward one and then backwards two. And they're just getting in your way of allowing you to care for them in the way that needs to happen. You know, there's things you have to do because you're the funeral director, but families want to come in and tell you differently or start doing things they're not supposed to be doing. Or, you know, one example, like coming in before you've even made funeral arrangements and already have a service scheduled and planned and done and, you know, or people who are running obituaries before the death occurs and then they walk in and tell you when things are going to be and then you don't have staff or anybody available because they never, you know, conferred with you if it worked. So these things do happen and it is very frustrating. And sometimes it does get to the point that you say, I'm sorry, we just can't serve you the way you need to be served and you need to find somewhere else. And every family is not fit with every funeral home. Just because someone has died doesn't mean that you should be serving them. They just might not be a match for your funeral home. And that's okay. It is okay on both sides because at the end of the day, as a staff, if you are berated or undermined or treated poorly, it, it 
it's not well serving for you as a funeral home as you're caring for all these other families as well, because it's going to reflect in your attitude and your actions. And so sometimes just getting rid of a bad situation by sending a family somewhere else is better for them and you. Um, and it doesn't mean anybody failed. It just means it wasn't a good match. Hey, Jeffrey Kisling, welcome and welcome from Massachusetts. How much do you talk about your work with your own kids? It's just an everyday conversation. You can ask me what I did for work or whatever, or they may walk into work with me and they see people set up in chapels and it's just natural. Um, I don't treat it as if it's any different than if I worked at a library or anywhere. It's life. Um, so obviously I don't get into a lot of um, specifics and things, but they ask me a lot of questions. And depending on the day of what I've shared, they may ask more questions, but I treat it as if it's a natural conversation. But I do tell them everybody's parents don't see dead people at work every day. So if you want to talk about mommy's work, that's fine, but it's not natural that everybody's talking about that at school. So my daughter this year, she logged in on her iPad and she had been logged in through something through my name and at school popped up, Carrie the Mortician. And she said, mom, I was kind of a little embarrassed. I said, but do you understand most of your friends don't know what the word mortician means? And she's like, no, I never thought about that. And she's, I said, well, it is. But like last week, um, we were at gymnastics or something and she was wearing her future mortician t-shirt that a viewer had sent me two shirts for the girls that say future morticians on them. And she was wearing it for gymnastics. And I'm like, I wonder what these other parents think of my little girl out there in her future <laughs> mortician t-shirt, you know, doing stuff. And she has no clue that it is not everyday commonplace, but there she was doing her thought, doing her thing in her future mortician t-shirt. I can only imagine these parents what they thought. Oh, let's see who's I am taking a college course on the history of American death practices. Your videos have helped me so very much. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. I wish I had more. I, I, I really want to do breakdown of religions and different things. If they have large lips and they look thin or flat, how do they make them look normal? Uh, tissue filler, or during the injecting process, it may plump up what was dehydrated in the tissue of the lips. So there's a few different options. Have you ever been to Philadelphia or Pennsylvania in general? I've never been to Philadelphia, but I have been to Pittsburgh. I visited the mortuary school there, and I'll be coming out to Pittsburgh again here probably in the next couple months um, for a little long visit to do some videos and stuff. So Good morning, Joshua. How are you? Yeah, Nan, I like to just be as honest with my kids um, as I can be, but trying to speak at their level. And um, kids take on more than you know, and they will ask you questions they want when they want to know the answers. And they deserve truthful, honest answers that don't need to be deep. They don't want like a soliloquy of an answer. A one sentence answer will satiate most children for a lot of these questions. Did you see what happened in Italy? Part of a coastal cemetery collapsed into the sea and hundreds of coffins are now underwater. Who would manage this if it happened in the US? So that would be where FEMA would come in and a DMORT response team would come in um, and they would all go and have to recover those caskets out of the ocean, identify the individuals, find a reburial site. So it is going to be quite a process, I would imagine for all of that. Um, that is, it is quite a catastrophe of what happened. Um, I imagine the families could be quite distraught that wondering if their loved ones out in the ocean and what's going on. So, and quite dangerous for everybody involved is more going to cave in. How can they secure what is still there? Um, so I'm sure they are as a country scurrying in that area to figure that all out. Can a family member witness the embalming of a loved one? Um, Possibly. It depends on the laws of the state. Um, most states do not allow anyone that is not licensed as an embalmer or as an apprentice to be in the preparation room. So if 
it is a state in that nature, then you are not allowed in there by law. Um, some funeral homes may allow it um, if you sign a whole bunch of paperwork. But as I've said in the past, I always ask what they are hoping to see and accomplish. Somebody may just want to help wash their mom's hair um, or bathe them. So possibly you just set that part of it up and then you can embalm after. So, hey, Paula, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. There's a mausoleum in Rhode Island that has fallen in disarray. State officials cannot decide who is responsible for fixing that building. Has it happened in my area? It has not happened in my area, um, but I do know this story. Um, it's been shared often and I've read some things about it. You know, that's why most cemeteries require you having a insurance policy over the cemetery. That way, if the cemetery is ever to close or shut, there is a support behind financially who would care for that space. Mary, recommendations on etiquette when attending a funeral, tips on what to wear. You know, I've been meaning to do an etiquette video about that. Um, I should do that. Maybe that I'll add that to my weekend videoing that I'm going to be doing. Um, you know, what to wear to a funeral is really across the board. You see people in like pajama pants and everything, and then you see people completely still dressed up to the nine. I think whatever you feel is respectful to that individual is what you should wear. Um, it is a formal event in my mind still, would you go to a wedding in what you're wearing to that funeral? Ask yourself that if this person was getting married, would you, what would you wear to their wedding? It's going to give you a good indicator of what may be appropriate for the funeral. Is it possible to add wheat to a person during the embalming process to make them look more like themselves after an illness? Yes, you can plump up the tissue. It's not technical weight. Um, but you can fill out the tissue with injecting and some of the fluids. And if not, you can use a tissue filler, which is kind of like Botox for the dead. Um, and you can add and take off a little of that edge from maybe a jawline or a brow line that is really ja jaunting out because of, or jutting out because of emaciation. Thank you, Nancy. Hey, Emma. I wish I could stay on live. Hey, Drew. Thank you. I'm downloaded. So Drew's been helping me with editing some video stuff to make sure we don't have glitchy next time. So um, hopefully I just downloaded what he sent me. So I'm hoping it works. Nancy, would a funeral home charge extra for someone to watch? They shouldn't know, um, but it depends on the funeral home. Hey, Josiah. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Hey, Ed and Robert. Jessica Rose. Okay. So crazy question. What happens to the pumps that may be beyond my face when I have the viewing for my grandpa, they were all gone. Pumps are pimp. Are you talking like pimples or like zits? Um, you, we would pop them or clear them off. Um, and you can make the skin pretty flawless with makeup and everything afterwards. If a person doesn't wish to be embalmed, how soon should he be buried after death? It depends on the state. Every state has different laws. Some states require that you have to be buried, cremated, or refrigerated within a certain period of time. Um, some require or embalmed. Um, so it, it really depends on the state and the laws as to when or if that needs to happen. I was the one who wrote you about crossing state lines with a body. Do you have to show some kind of permit? And if so, who? Like truckers have wait stations. Is there a thing for bodies? There is not. So only if you get pulled over, would you need to show why there's a dead body in the back? There is something called a burial transit permit. So that is filled out and sent with the deceased wherever they go, whether it's to the cemetery and then filed at the cemetery or whether it's with the person transporting them across the state, across state lines, across the country, um, to another country, that permit allows them to go where they're going to go and is signed by the funeral director. Thank you guys for joining. This is good. I asked you about the fungus on my Nana's body. Thank you so much for getting back to me. Just wondering what it looks like it is like on food. Yeah, it's just usually fungus growing on an individual looks like this fuzzy, whitish, sometimes greenish, sometimes yellowish fuzz that grows. Um, it's not like green mold. Usually it's like, it's like this fuzzy layer of a fungus that grows. It's really weird looking and you can usually wash it off. Um, depending how 
long the person has been there, but you can sometimes wash it off, reapply makeup and possibly view again, depending how the person looks. I'm actually thinking of education for an embalmer service care after death. Yes, Nancy, do it. Do you put mortuary cosmetics on men? Yes, we do. Um, we just have to balance color. The basic of why we do the cosmetics is balancing color. People are often very pale um, and they look all one monotone and we are not monotone. When we are warm, we have warm spots. Our eyelids, the center of our forehead, our cheeks, tip of our nose and the tip of our chin. Those are called your warm spots. So they need to be warmer looking by being a little pinker and that gives a little more um, lifelike appearance and a little bit more natural appearance to how someone is. Same with on your hands. I mean, the back of like on your knuckles and stuff are redder than on the rest of your hand. So if you're one complete monotone look, you really look dead. Um, it's, it's just natural that that's how you're going to look with no heat and no movement of your blood underneath. So we kind of just restore some of that pink edge to, or warm spots to the individual's face and hands. I work for a funeral answering service and we got so many upset callers that are desperate for funeral home calendars, cursing, yelling, hanging up on me. It's the hardest calls I've taken. The people that go after funeral home calendars are legit. They want those things. Um, whether it's the wall calendar, whether it's a desk calendar, whether it's the sticky calendars, people want that free calendar. It is crazy. We'll have a different funeral homes I've worked at. People will come in and take them by handfuls. And they, I don't know what they do with all these calendars, but man, do they want them. I'm like, go to the dollar store. You can buy a calendar if you're that desperate for a calendar. But that is so funny you bring that up because it is. It's a weird little nuance of funeral homes. Same with the mint people. A lot of funeral homes have out like bowls of um, like the Lifesavers mint in individual little packages and stuff. I have had people pick up a bowl and dump the whole bowl in their pocket of their jacket I had one day a girl, this little girl, like an eight-year-old, nine-year-old girl had like the knee-high boots on, you know, the style. Um, and she opened her boot, dumped a whole thing of mints down in it with her parents watching, bad parents, dumped a whole thing of mints down in there, zipped it up and put the empty mint container back. I'm like, you need mints that bad. You are going to steal a whole bowl of mints that are staying out at a funeral. So the things we see, it's, they're humorous, but it's also like, really, this is how sad society is. Some of these things, it's crazy. It is crazy. So, oh, do you think it would be hard for a director to accept me as a shadow during COVID? Um, no, like right now it's, it's slowing down in areas. So don't let COVID be your excuse per se of why you're not going to call a funeral home. Let the funeral home tell you they don't have time for that right now. Call. If you want a shadow, shadow. Don't use any excuse to stop yourself. Just do it. Make the phone call. Stop into the funeral home. Go visit. Do it. Um, okay, I'm going to do one more question. Oh, Desiree. She did the boot trick at the movie theater. Well, I get that to sneak something in, you would do that. But to steal everything they had, it's not like you stole things at the movie theater. Oh. I was just at a funeral for my husband's grandmother and we saw a man in a casket for the next viewing and he looked all one color. My husband was very freaked out as he had never seen a deceased before. It's so true though, um, that people are just monotone and even their lips are the same color. That's why we have to put lip color on an individual. My lips are not the same color as my cheek. And so if it was that way, you look so dead. And our goal is that you're not going to look super dead when you're dead. And I know that sounds st stupid, but we want the person to look a little more natural to you and natural to you who loved them was not monotone. So breaking away from that monotone coloring, big, big thing. So, oh, all right, I'm gonna stop. Thank you guys for joining. I appreciate you. Um, 
constantly content is coming. I have so many, so many videos I'm working on. It is like a never ending. You guys bring the most amazing requests that I feel like I just can't keep up with. And I love it. So you keep me busy in a good way. So keep them coming. Um, Coffee with Carrie is the one segment that I think I get a lot of people coming into the because it's a live segment. So if you're new here, click subscribe, make sure you do that. Um, I also have coffee with Carrie mugs. They're available on my website, carrienorthy.com. I'm going to have a coffee mug sale coming up here. So watch for that to post on my social media and everything. I want to clean out some stock so I can maybe get some new merchandise. What do you feel about that? Um, What kind of merchandise would you like to see coming? I get requests for merchandise, but I don't know what it is that you're in demand for. So watch for a mug sale. Let's get rid of some of these mugs. Get a mug in your hand so you can have some coffee with me during Coffee with Carrie. So I thank you guys. Email if you have questions. I'm still looking for, I think, five more state interviewees. So if you're in Alaska, if you're in, I think, North Dakota, um, if you're in, is it Vermont maybe we still need? I need viewers to ask me three questions in a Zoom video to help me fulfill my state videos. So send them my way. Email me, carrienorthy.com. And again, please think about Kathleen Morton's family today and her one-year anniversary of her death. So thanks, guys. I appreciate you. I'll see you next week. Bye.